Happy Easter. Welcome to New Hope. We're so glad that you're here with us. And you know, it's our hope that you would find this service so that it could be an encouragement to you. If we can pray for you, in our description is a link that you can check out so that our team can do just that. We have an incredible Easter experience, so let's get ready to celebrate it together. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Happy Easter, New Hope. Welcome to worship. Come on, jump up on your feet if you're able. Put your hands together like this. Here we go.
Well, happy Easter. We are here to praise the Lord. My name's Adam Bishop. I'm the senior pastor here. I'm glad you're here. My wife and Morgan and I have been praying for this day for many months, and uh, we're glad you're here, especially if it's your first time. We're honored, and uh, we hope you have a great experience. We have a free gift for you that we would like to give you on your way out today. So make sure you swing by the guest services area on the left-hand side of our lobby today um, on your way out, and we will give you that gift as a thank you from us to you for joining us today. And we would like to invite you to our next New to New Hope coming up on Sunday, April the 14th. If you have recently started attending our church, or if today's your first time here, this is your next step. It's a lunch that takes place after our 11 o'clock service. It's super casual. Our entire staff team will be here and you'll get to hear all about the history of our church and where we believe God is leading us in the future and how you can be a part of it. If you would like to sign up, scan the QR code on the screen or the seat back in front of you. Yeah, that QR code works for all of these next steps we're talking about. The next of which is our next New Hope Night of Worship, Wednesday, April 24th. It's gonna be incredible. Get fired up about that. Now, if you've never attended a night of worship and you're like, why are they clapping? That should be a hint, all right? It's an incredible experience. We'd love for you to join us. We are asking you to register. That will help us through that QR code, register. Um, help us better prepare for the evening. Our worship team has written and released four original songs on an album called This House, which will be available in its entirety on Friday, April 5th. So be on the lookout for that. We'll be singing those songs as well as some other th songs, and we'll, uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us then on Wednesday, April 25th, yep. 4th, my bad, yes. for our next night of worship. Also, Mother's Day is going to be here before you know it, so go ahead and mark your calendars to be here on Sunday, May the 12th. We are going to have family photo booths and a free gift for every woman who attends that day. And it's our next child dedication. If you have a baby or a little one and you have not yet dedicated them to the Lord, it's an incredible experience. Adam and I dedicated our three boys when they were little and it was a significant spiritual marker in our life. So if you have any questions or would like to sign up, scan that QR code and choose child dedication as your next step. Let me say thanks for your generosity and giving. That's what makes everything we do as a church possible, from things like child dedication to serving in our local community, partnering with one of our local missional partners, one of which is Habitat for Humanity. We were recently able to complete a house here in Durham. Uh, many of you participated in the construction of that house, so thank you. And for those of you who give, just know that when you give, it goes to things like this, literally. A family who otherwise did not have a home now has one. You are a part of that because of your faithfulness and generosity and giving. Many of you have already given online this week. Thank you. If you'd like to give and our services today, there are some black giving boxes that you can use on your way out. And then finally, quick reminder, next Sunday, we are back to our normal worship service times of 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. We'll be kicking off a brand new series. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later in our service, but we'd love to have you back. It's going to be a great experience but obviously today, great experience celebrating the resurrection. As you can see, our worship team has some great music they've prepared for you. You can clap for celebrating the resurrection. That's all right. Go ahead. Go ahead. So again, if, if it's your first time with us, it's how we roll. So uh, if you get excited about a little something, we like to show it. And uh, we are excited. Jesus is alive. We're going to continue to celebrate that. But before we go any further, would you join us as we pray together? Dear God, thank you that we get to celebrate what you did on that first Easter by raising your son from the dead. Lord, don't let us miss what you have for us today. Lord, block the distractions and speak to our hearts. For we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Church, if you'll just stand and if you're able and join us. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are kind. Every man will bow down and say you are king. So let's start right.
just want to be with you. We just want to be with you. King of glory, come fill this place. We just want to be with you. We just want to be If you said it, we 
we believe it, and so it's done, amen? Yes, God. Cause you said it, and I believe it. You said it, and it is. Oh! 
So God, we thank you that you are holy. God, we thank you that right now there's angels encircling your throne saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And God, we thank you that because of that holiness that is who you are, that Jesus made a way for us to be in your presence. That when he walked out of that tomb, we now can enter into your presence. God, thank you for that. God, thank you for raising your son from the dead. Thank you that we can worship you today. God, thank you that that gives us hope for whatever we are walking through. And God, thank you that because of what you did that first Easter, we can keep our eyes fixed on you, not on everything going on around us. So we rejoice in that. We thank you for that. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Go ahead and grab a seat, and uh, as, as you do, if you see any empty seats beside you, um, let our ushers know. They're still trying to help a few people find somewhere to sit, and that would certainly help them. And you could even slide in a little bit if you wanted to do that as well. Hey, uh, before we jump in, I got a lot of things I'm excited to share with you today. We have an amazing team of volunteers that are up here a lot, and um, man, they serve us so well. So would you guys uh, just take a minute and join me as we thank our production team and our worship team for just how they serve us so well. So blessed every single week. So John chapter 20, that's where we're gonna be. If you have a Bible, you wanna turn there, you can. Um, if you don't have a Bible, that's all right. We'll put all the verses up here on the screen uh, for you. This is the text you would expect to be seeing on Easter Sunday, where we talk about that first resurrection Sunday and what happened that day. But what I hope to show you today is that the sequence of events aren't necessarily something that lead to the conclusion that the passage teaches. In fact, the title of today's message is Easter Events That Don't add up. And what I hope to show you is that what we see in John chapter 20 really doesn't add up 
at all. And since we're gonna be talking about that and talking about adding, I thought it might be a little fun to start off our time together with a little bit of a math problem, okay? You didn't think you were gonna do math on Easter Sunday. Well, you are, okay? So for those of you who like math, you're about to have fun. For the rest of y'all who are normal like me, don't like math, just bear with me, okay? Hopefully you'll still find some fun in it as well. But we're gonna do a little word problem. So before we do, before you put your thinking caps on, I want to preemptively encourage you with this. More than 50% of students at Harvard, MIT, and Princeton got this question wrong, okay? So if you get this wrong, you're in good company, all right? A lot of smart people got this question wrong, so let's put it up here on the screen. Let's see if you can figure it out, all right? A little word problem on Easter Sunday. A bat and a ball cost a dollar and 10 cents. The bat cost one dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost, all right? So sit there, think about this. You can cheat, it's all right. We're not gonna pass out scantrons, number two pencils, anything like that, all right? So go ahead and talk to your neighbor, see if you can work on this together. Some of y'all are staring at me like, for real? For real, all right, go with it, okay? Just see if you can figure this out. See if you can figure this out. Just out of curiosity, how many of you think the answer is 10 cents? Wave your hand in the air, like you just don't care, all right? <laughs> 10 cents. All right. 10 cents is the incorrect answer, okay? I know, now you feel dumb in church. I'm sorry, all right? Made you raise your hand. I thought it was 10 cents for like a solid day, all right? So uh, don't worry about it if you guessed 10. How many of y'all, just a little curiosity here, how many, well now see, I can't do that because if I give the other answer, y'all all, you know what, let's just all do it. How many of you thought it was five cents? Of course you did. See, now you should all raise your hands because that's the correct answer, it's five cents, okay? Like, how is that possible? I've been working on this all week, all right? So let me tell you how this works. You gotta start with the price of the ball first. So if you start with the price of the ball, let's just imagine the ball is 10 cents. Remember, the bat is a full dollar more, so that's a dollar and 10 cents. You add them together, that's a dollar 20. That's why 10 cents is incorrect. But if you start with five cents and you add a full dollar more, you got five cents plus a dollar five cents gets you to the total of a dollar and 10. So for those of you who guessed five cents, you're really smart. Smarter than 50% of the students at MIT, Harvard, and Princeton. That should encourage you this morning, okay? Like, well, then how, does, how do you get it wrong? I need y'all to refocus, all right? You're acting like a bunch of middle schoolers, all right? Refocus, okay? I throw out one word problem, I lose the whole room, right? Everybody refocus, okay? So how, how do you get that wrong? Well, it's, it's the order of the words. That's what confuses everyone. And so the fancy pants who created this whole little word problem, here's what they said. Here's their summary statement, okay? Many people are overconfident, prone to place too much faith in their intuitions. So I placed too much faith in my intuitions when I guessed 10 cents, immediately my brain went there. That's not the correct answer. And when you place too much faith in your intuitions, it doesn't add up. And I hope to show you that the people who were there that first Resurrection Sunday, in my opinion, placed way too much faith in their own intuition, so much so that they literally missed what was happening right in front of them. So we're gonna read through John chapter 20, and then we're going to build our own Easter equation, if you will, from this passage, and we'll see if these events add up. Starting in verse one, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So this is the first step in our Easter equation, if you will, for today. Mary Magdalene sees an empty tomb. Verse two, she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I think it's fantastic that John wants the record to show for all of human history, he's faster than Peter. That's amazing. <laughs> and it's just like a man. And I love that it's in the Bible. It's fantastic, okay? Verse five, he bent over, looked in the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who'd reached the team first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So this is the second part of our Easter equation. Now Peter and John have seen an empty tomb. Let me summarize the next seven verses for you. Mary Magdalene is going to return to the empty tomb. She's gonna have a conversation with someone who she mistakenly thinks is the gardener until this individual says her name, and then she recognizes it's in fact 
Jesus. And so now the third part of our Easter equation is Mary Magdalene has a conversation with Jesus. And that matters because originally she thought, because she told the disciples, that his body had been removed. But now she knows he's actually alive. She's talked to him. And then Jesus gives her some very specific instructions of what to do, which means he wants her to go tell the disciples. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. So the last, the fourth and final step of our Easter equation is Mary Magdalene goes back and tells the disciples about this conversation she's had with Jesus. And so if we look at all of these steps combined together, empty tomb, conversation with Jesus, telling the disciples about the conversation with Jesus, all of them should result in a great celebration. It's Resurrection Sunday. Jesus is actually alive. They should begin to tell everyone this good news. Remember, the title of our message today is Easter Events That Don't Add Up. And the reason why these Easter events don't add up is all of these events result in the disciples locking themselves in a room because they're scared. Like, how's that even possible? And yet that's what the very next verse tells us Verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, it's the evening of the same day. The same day they saw an empty tomb. The same day Mary Magdalene had this conversation. That very evening they have locked themselves when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. So on the very same day, they've locked themselves behind closed door. And the verse says, because of fear. So how's that possible? Like, how do you see an empty tomb and react that way? Well, it's actually our big idea for today. You see, there was a gap between the reality of the resurrection and the reality of what they were experiencing emotionally. These guys had had a tough week. My older two boys, Sam and Jacob, 14 and 12, we, we watched The Passion of the Christ this weekend. It's hard to believe that movie came out 20 years ago. If you haven't watched it, Lately, I would encourage you to do so. It gives a really accurate picture of what happened in the events from Jesus' arrest through his crucifixion to the resurrection. And think about it from the disciples' perspective. I mean, they came from the high of Palm Sunday where it looked like Jesus was finally going to ascend to the king, to the throne, to the confusion of his arrest, to the brutal beating, to watching him die on a cross, and now they're wrestling with this reality that there's actually an empty tomb, and their emotions are all over the place, and that's created this gap. Between seeing a tomb that's empty and that gap resulting in fear is what's keeping them from celebrating in this resurrection. And for many of us, perhaps on this Easter Sunday, we could relate. Not with seeing an empty tomb, we weren't there that first Easter, but we could relate from the gap that sometimes is created in our own lives. Between taking once a year and giving formal acknowledgement that Jesus is actually alive, that Jesus walked out of the tomb, that this is the holy day of celebration for Christians all over the world, and we acknowledge the resurrection, and let for a lot of people, maybe even you today, there's a gap between the reality of the resurrection and the reality of what you're walking through in your life. And maybe that gap has left you in a place emotionally where it just doesn't add up. Where if God is good enough to raise his son from the dead, and if Jesus is really alive, and if all of these people keep worshiping him, why do bad things keep happening to you? I mean, if God is so good and he could stop these things from happening, why'd your spouse walk out? Why is your child estranged from you right now? Why are your finances a mess? Why did you get the health diagnosis? We could stay here all day with the list of things that happen in our lives, and that list that reality for many of us is what creates this gap. What do you do? When you're faced with the reality of the resurrection and it doesn't match up with the reality of your own life and or emotional experience, and what we're gonna see for the rest of our time together today is it's not actually what we're supposed to do, but what Jesus does for us. Because what Jesus does for these disciples after they've locked themselves in a room for, out of fear is remarkable. And what he does for them is a picture of what I believe he does for us as well. So if you're taking notes today, I wanna encourage you to jot down a few things as we move through the rest of this passage. First of all, Jesus meets us where we are. 
where we are. Maybe you're here today, things are going great. Maybe you're joining us online and things aren't going so great. Maybe you're here in the room and things aren't going so great. So many times we find ourselves in these different seasons of our life, the highs and the lows, the ebbs and the flows, and we can't make sense of all of it. And what I wanna encourage you with today is regardless of where you're at, regardless of what you're going through, Jesus meets you right where you are. This is exactly what he does for the disciples. This is my favorite part of the story. So I I started reading verse 19 a few minutes ago. I wanna pick it back up with there and continue into verse 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, seriously, you were with me for three years. Is that what your Bible says? No, no, that's exactly what I would have said. I'd have been like, I walked out of a tomb and y'all are hiding like a bunch of scared little boys. It's not what Jesus says at all. Look what he says to them. Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. He walks into their fear and says, I'm here to bring some peace. He walks into the storm they're experiencing and says, I'm here to bring some calm. He didn't walk in there and chastise them. He didn't walk in there and condemn them. He didn't walk in there and tell them, y'all should know better than this. He literally walked in there, met them where they were, and the reality of their emotions and said, peace be with you. And for many of you here today, that's really good news. Jesus wants to meet you right where you're at. But here's the thing. You don't have to get your act together first. I've been doing this long enough as a pastor to know that's how a lot of people think. It's not that they don't think Jesus loves them. It's not that they don't believe Jesus won't meet them where they're at. They just know there's a few things about their life they need to get fixed or cleaned up first. It's that secret sin nobody else knows about. I mean, if you could just get that taken care of, then sure, I'm, I'm willing to let Jesus come into my life. But pastor, you don't understand, there's just a few things I gotta take care of first. Maybe you're thinking, I just need to, I need to be a better spouse. I need to be a better parent. I need to, you know, I need to come to church more. There's just this list of things that if I could just get to those things, here's my favorite, okay? Again, if you've been around church for longer than five minutes, maybe someone said this to you before, okay? You tell them what's going on in your life and then they say, you know what? You just need to think a little more biblically about your situation, Y'all, I'm a preacher, and I don't even know what that means, okay? I have no idea what that means, to think biblically about my situation. Anytime we come up with something to say in response to the truth that Jesus wants to meet us where we are, here's what we're doing. We're placing a condition on it, placing a condition on ourselves. It's the as long as I can, fill in the blank, then I'm willing to let Jesus step into my life. But see, here's some good news for you. Jesus doesn't operate that way. Jesus comes into your life with an unconditional love. Jesus comes into your life with an unconditional love that meets you wherever you are. You say, well, pastor, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Welcome to the club. None of us are where we're supposed to be. That's why God sent Jesus to get us to him because we couldn't get to him on our own. So wherever you are today, Jesus wants to show up in your life. He wants to meet you right where you are. Will you let him in? Here's the second thing we see from this story today. Isolation makes everything more difficult. There's one guy in the story who had isolated himself. The Bible doesn't tell us why. We just know he's not there. When Jesus shows up and says, peace be with you to the disciples, there's one of the disciples, he should have been there. For whatever reason, he's not. His name is Thomas, and this one mistake of isolating himself leaves him with a nickname for all of his life. All of human history, Doubting Thomas. How would you like your worst mistake to be a nickname you had to go by for the rest of your life? This was Thomas's reality, okay? Why? He'd isolated himself. Verse 24, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when they came, when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to him, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas has isolated himself. He can't believe. He's isolated himself. It's difficult to think good things have happened. And for many of us, when we walk through difficult seasons in our life, what makes it worse is sometimes we isolate ourselves. We isolate ourselves from other people. Sometimes we can isolate ourselves even when we are with other people. 
Sometimes we could show up at church every single week and, and kind of do the drill, you know, get the happy face on, make sure everything looks like it's good. I mean, some of y'all had World War III on the way to get to church today, right? And your minivan, all right? And your 2.5 kids, y'all was fighting, you got to church, like, y'all better smile, it's Easter, all right? I know the drill. So how do you know that? That happens in my home too, okay? That's how I know that. But when you isolate yourself, it can make things more challenging. Some of you, in a moment of honesty, your life's a little bit of a mess. It's just a little bit of a mess. Maybe God's brought you here today to just kind of like recognize that. I'm not trying to come down on you, but it can be hard when somebody tells you your life is a little bit of a mess. I was just told a few weeks ago by a chiropractor, that very statement. I went to see a chiropractor. My back was hurting me and different things. And the chiropractor did all this different stuff and it hurt real bad. And finally, the chiropractor finished. And I said, well, what's the diagnosis? You know, what do I need to do? And the chiropractor literally looked at me and said, sir, you are a mess. Wow, I mean, you could have delivered that. A little bedside manner would be helpful here, right? I was like, what do you mean? And the chiropractor said, well, one of your legs is longer than the other. That is not good, okay? It's not how God created us. And I like that. I like being told my you know, whole body and back and all the things that I don't understand were a mess. I didn't like that. If I say your life's a little bit of a mess, you may not like that this morning. But just in a moment, hear from the Lord. Some of you created the mess. And you're carrying around shame. God doesn't want you to carry around that shame. That's why he sent Jesus to the cross. For some of you, your life's a little bit of a mess because of something someone did to you. And you're carrying around resentment and bitterness. And you're not sure what to do with that. And, and when we find ourselves in that place where we recognize, yeah, there's some challenges in my life, we acknowledge because this passage says Jesus wants to meet us where we are. And then we have to come to grips with maybe one of the things that's making it difficult for us to move forward is isolation. And so I just wanna encourage you a little bit with some opportunities to maybe combat isolation. That's one of our beliefs here at New Hope is that we have to work really hard to fight the enemy's attack of isolation in our life. For example, next Sunday, we're kicking off a brand new series. It's called Jesus Unscripted. We're gonna be in the Gospel of Mark for eight weeks. And so for the next eight weeks, we're gonna be studying Mark's Gospel. If you like to read the Bible each day, spend a little bit of time in Mark's Gospel. If you're new to the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're the first four books of the New Testament. We're in John today. John does a lot of theological things, and sometimes, honestly, it can be a little challenging to follow along. Mark is not like that at all. Mark just gets to the point. Mark has Jesus going all over the place. I am fairly convinced Mark had ADD, okay, to the glory of God. And I'm really grateful for that because I, I really struggle with staying focused. And so Mark's a fun book to read. We're gonna come in here eight consecutive Sundays, take a passage of scripture, unpack it, see how God can use it in our lives. Can I encourage you to be here? If you can't be here every Sunday, that's okay. Perfect attendance is not a requirement in New Hope Church, all right? Get here when you can. If you can't be here on campus, we broadcast live on, online every single week. If you can't be with us online live, we make the services available on demand starting on Sunday afternoon. So you have no excuse to not let God speak into your life through this teaching series. We've already mentioned our next New to New Hope. It's a great opportunity just to sit around and get connected. It's about 45 minutes. We're super fancy. We have pizza, okay? We're not trying to impress you. We're trying to get you connected, all right? 45 minutes will accelerate your opportunities to get connected here in the life of our church. And then lots of other opportunities. Again, combating isolation, getting connected. Let me just walk you through a few of those. First of all, our next generation ministry. If you've got kids or teenagers, I wanna encourage you to get them connected into our kids' ministry or our student ministry. Again, our boys, 14, 12, and eight. We have them connected in the appropriate age ministries here. If you've got a little one, check them in on Sundays. If you've got an elementary school student, check them in on Sundays. If you've got a middle school or high school student, get them up here on Wednesday nights. Why? Your kids need to be around other kids who have God on their radar. Your kids need to be around other kids so that they can see, wait a second, I'm not the only one. I'm not isolated. There are other kids in the same season of my life that are walking with God too. You need to get your kids and your teenagers around other adults who love Jesus and will speak into their lives because they stopped listening to you a long time ago. Okay? Get them up here. Check them in. You're like, well, pastor, I hear you. I don't necessarily disagree with you, but see, my child my child doesn't really like coming to church. Since when did your child get a vote? <laughs> you don't run a democracy in your home. Come on. 
say, I hear you, I love you, and it's because I love you that this is what we're gonna do. And one day when they're adults, they'll thank you, okay? Maybe you're a young adult, age 18 to 35, difficult season of your life. There are dozens of testimonies here at New Hope of people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s that could tell you they threw away a decade of their life called the 20s. Don't do the same. It's one of the decades that the enemy gets a lot of people off track. You cannot go through that decade of your life on your own. There's just too many things that will come your way to get you off track. So get with God's people. Tuesday nights, the second and fourth Tuesday night of each month, our young adults gather. You don't have to go through this season alone. There's countless opportunities to serve. We mentioned serving with Habitat for Humanity. We literally have local missional partners and we are constantly serving in our community. And for some of you, that's gonna be the best way that you make new friends. You're not necessarily looking to sit around and talk. You like to do things. And we got a lot of people around here that like to do things as well. We have missions opportunities. We've got a team going to the Dominican Republic in just a few weeks. There's opportunities to get connected with God's people through serving, not just here locally, but literally overseas. We have countless New Hope groups that meet all over the place. Some meet here on our campus, some meet in our community. Again, a great way to make friends, grow in your faith, learn more about God's word. And then Right Now Media is a great resource available to you And it's free, and it's kind of like a Netflix with a library of lots of different spiritual growth options. So maybe you're like, man, my my life's busy right now. I can't really get to anything other than Sunday. I hear you. We understand, which is why we encourage you to take advantage of this. I mean, one night a week, get the family together, watch an episode with some type of spiritual growth resource that's age appropriate. If you don't have kids, maybe you get together with your spouse. But, But it's a way to bring biblical truth into your home and create a little bit of community at home. Are your kids isolated in their own home? Are you isolated in your own marriage? This can happen. This is the enemy strategy. That QR code that we've already mentioned a few times, you can use the same one. All of these next steps are available. And if you'll follow them, they'll help you get connected. And it would be a shame to come to an Easter service and let it just be that. Let this Easter service serve as a way to get you started on a journey to get connected with God's people so you can combat isolation. Let me give you the next thing we see from this story. Blessing follows believing. Blessing follows believing. This is one of the biggest principles in all of God's word, Old Testament, New Testament. And Jesus is going to give us very specific language about this principle. So we're gonna go back to kind of the same setting, but it's a week later. So same room, week later, this time Thomas is there, and let's see how the events unfold. Starting in verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas, this time, was with them. Though the doors were locked, they keep locking the doors. We're not gonna get into it, okay? They locked the doors again. Jesus came and stood among them. What does he say? Same thing, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand, put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Look what Jesus says. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Remarkable. If you're a Christ follower, Jesus was talking about you on that day. Jesus was saying, Thomas, you're seeing me right now in person, but there are literally going to be millions of people for the next 2,000 years who choose to believe in me by faith. And when they do, they're going to bring blessing into their life. Hey, just in a moment of honesty, I'm not trying to step on your toes. There are a lot of you that you want God's blessing, you just haven't chosen yet to believe. And then, God, if you could just show me a little bit more, then I would believe. But you see, it doesn't work that way. We choose to believe by faith. And if you'll choose to believe by faith, you will unleash God's blessing in unprecedented ways into your life. He said, but it was kind of easy for Thomas. I mean, he was there with Jesus. What evidence do we have? Well, there's lots of biblical evidence. There's lots of historical evidence. But the greatest evidence of the resurrection for 2,000 years of church history has been a changed life. A changed life. There's no other reason for people to change the way they live other than having an encounter with Jesus Christ and that literally changing them. The Bible says it moves people from death to life. See, Jesus did not come down a cross and walk out of the tomb so that you could go from being a bad person to a good person. No, no, Jesus came and he died on the cross and he walked out of the tomb so that you could move from death to life. That's what happened at the first Easter. And I got some good news to share with y'all. Over the last two weeks, 
We've had a bunch of people decide they actually wanna let everybody know that they've made this decision. We have had 62 people go public through baptism over the last two weeks in our church. <laughs> 62 walking testimonies to the resurrection. The greatest evidence, which has always been a changed life. The fourth thing we see from our story today is that knowing about does not equal believing in. We started talking about Easter events that don't add up, so let's kind of use a not equal sign to get back to a little math mindset here for a second. And for many of us, we struggle with that because we've equated the two to be the same, that knowing about Jesus, knowing about the resurrection, knowing about the first Easter means that we believe in it. And the reason why we oftentimes make these things the same is because the word we use for believe carries with it the connotation of agreement, or the connotation of giving mental assent. But see, biblically speaking, that's just the starting point for believing. Biblically speaking, to believe means to align one's life with. To believe means to submit one's life to. And for many of you here today, you know about the events of Easter, but Maybe I could challenge you to ask the question, have you ever truly believed in it? The way that God's word challenges us to. John's gonna wrap up this passage with two remarkable verses that actually give us the reason for why he recorded all of these events. Verse 30 of John chapter 20, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Remarkable. John says there's a lot of things Jesus did that are not included in this gospel that's significant because John wrote this gospel in about AD 90 to AD 95, about 60 years after the resurrection. We believe that God's word was inspired by the Holy Spirit, which means John just didn't sit down and write whatever he wanted to. The Holy Spirit guided him. And John says there's a lot of things that are not included in this gospel account. It was the last gospel written. Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already been written. But look at what he says in the next verse. It's the purpose for the entire gospel. But these things that are written are written that you may believe. John says a lot of things Jesus did that I'm not telling you about, but there's enough here for you to believe. And then he tells us what that actually looks like. That you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Lots of stuff Jesus did, we'll find out about in heaven one day, not included in God's word. There's enough there for you to believe. A lot of things about Jesus we don't know. There's enough there for you to believe. A lot of things about Jesus you may not understand. There's enough there for you to believe. And so my question for you this Easter is, is, is have you ever come to a place in your life where you've chosen to believe? You. Not your parents, not your grandparents, not your spouse. You. So you say, well, I've, I've got a kid, I've got a teenager, they've given their life to Jesus, that, that, I must have something to do with that. No, it's a decision that every single person has to make on their own. You say, well, what does it mean to choose to believe the way the Bible lays it out for us, where John gives us the three phrases. First of all, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? The word Messiah is an Old Testament word. It means that God was going to send someone to do something about this problem called sin. And sin has been a problem ever since Adam and Eve first sinned and brought sin into the world. And every person born since then has been born with a sin nature. And sometimes people struggle with that. Say, no, I actually think we're born good and then the world and, and society kind of corrupts us. Listen, if you don't believe people are born with a sin nature, I will let you serve in the two-year-old class in the next service. <laughs> you will see sin nature on full display. No one's ever had to teach a child how to say mine. You have to t teach a child how to share. We all have it. And it's that sin nature that brings havoc into our lives. But see, God wasn't gonna let sin keep you from him. This gap that sin created, God bridged that gap for you through Jesus. This is why Jesus had to go to the cross. He paid the price for your sin. So your sin's been paid for. Sin is not what sends people to hell. It's one of the biggest misunderstandings about God's word. Sin is not what sends people to hell. Your sin's been paid for. 
People condemn themselves to hell when they choose not to receive the free gift of Jesus Christ and the payment he's made for their sin. It'd be like if someone gave you a gift on Christmas morning that you really hoped you could receive and you walked away from it and said, no thanks, I don't really want that free gift. That decision is what condemns an individual to hell. But see, that's not God's will. God tells us that God is being patient so that none would perish. God has made a way through the sacrifice of his son, the Messiah, Jesus, for your sin. Do you believe that? The verse says that Jesus is the son of God. See, that matters because what it means is there's none like him. There's never been anyone who claimed to be the son of God. There's never been anyone in all of human history who claimed to be like God, to be one with the Father, and yet Jesus made this claim. His resurrection is how he backed up this claim. See, anybody could say anything they want. And there have been lots of religious leaders over all of human history who have fooled people by saying things. And for many of you, you may have categorized Jesus into that group of individuals. Might I challenge you to think differently this morning that Jesus is different. See, C.S. Lewis said it best, Jesus is either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. Either he lied to everybody while he was here, he was a lunatic, the craziest person who's ever walked the planet, or he's actually who he said he was. And along with millions of others over the last 2,000 years, I've chosen that third option, that I believe the evidence of human history demonstrates Jesus walked out of the tomb, therefore backing up what he said as God's son, that there's no one who's ever done that before. And I just made the decision as a child. Nobody talked me into it, but I came to a place in my life where I reached a real simple conclusion. If Jesus was dead and then he was alive again, I wanna be on his team. I wanna be on his team. And I gave my life to him. Have you ever believed that? And then finally, the passage says that it's by believing you may have life in his name. Here's what that means. Nobody's, nobody else's name counts. Yours, another leader of another belief system. Jesus is the only one who said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. It's really popular in our world today to say things like, you know what, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere, because at the end of the day, that's what really counts. And I just think that as long as somebody really does their best, that they'll probably go to heaven one day. Listen, I'm not trying to sound judgmental. I wrestle with a lot of things in God's word. I certainly don't think I have everything figured out. But what I would ask you to consider this morning is that that line of thinking is actually a lie. And I would challenge you to study literature for the last 2,000 years and find where that line of thought existed anywhere before the last 50 years. That line of thinking that anybody can believe what they want as long as they're sincere only shows up in the last 50 years. It's more reflective of our culture than what different religions have taught for the entirety of their existence. It's a lie. And the reason why that lie has taken root is because we live in a very soft society that's afraid of offending anyone. And the most offensive thing you can do is not be truthful with another person. That if you believe something to be true and you believe that it actually will affect all of their eternity and where they will spend it, the most loving thing you can do is communicate that with abundant clarity. That is my heart today. To communicate what God's word says with abundant clarity that you actually can be saved, that you can experience eternal life, but it is only through his name. Would you bow your head with me this morning? And as I've been sharing, some of you have been feeling something. It's the Lord saying today is your day of salvation. And if that's where you are today, can I encourage you just to agree with what God's doing in your life? You say, how do I do that? Well, just where you're seated right now, the best way you know how, you just pray, Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. But I believe you died on the cross for my sin. So my sin no longer keeps me from God. Jesus, I believe you walked out of the tomb that first Easter Sunday and that you're alive. And I wanna ask you to come into my life and save me. I received this free gift of salvation. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. For the rest of my life, I'll live for you. 
Hey, if you prayed that prayer, everybody's heads are bowed, everybody's eyes are closed, but I would love to pray for you this week. Would you mind just slipping your hand up just so I could see that, so I can pray for you? Thank you. I wanna pray for you this week. Thank you. Everybody's heads are still bowed, their eyes are still closed. Those of you who raised your hands, you don't have to do it right now, but if you want to, you can. If you wanna do it before you leave, we've mentioned this QR code several times today. There's a next step there that just simply says, following Jesus. If you'll select that, it'll allow us to send you a free resource in the mail this week just to help you get started on your new spiritual journey. One of our pastors would love to be in contact with you just to provide some encouragement for you as well. But tell somebody, don't keep that to yourself. And so God, we thank you that death could not hold your son, that you raised him from the dead, that we have hope because Jesus is alive. We have hope because we live in a world where you raised your son from the dead. And God, because we have that hope, here's what we will declare. We trust you. God, for all those of us walking through difficult seasons, we still declare our trust. And God, as we move into this time of response, fill this place with your presence, speak to your people as your children, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, if you're able, would you stand with us? Let's worship together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood, and
That's why I trust Him I saw the Lord And He heard And He answered I saw the Lord And He heard And He answered I saw the Lord And He heard And He answered That's why I trust Him as we worshiped our God together today. Hey, don't forget, if there's any way that we can serve you, there are links in the description that you can check out so that our team can do just that and you can learn even more about the heart of our church. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can experience even more services like this and we can't wait to see you right back here next week. Y'all know it. Come on, walk with me to the fountain To the well that's never dry Put your hope in living water